You know, you bring up a good point in terms of FH. Just quick definition on that. I've mentioned it many times on my channel. I tend to say the overall message is that LDL usually doesn't matter. It doesn't matter nearly as much as your typical doc thinks, but there are folks for whom it does matter. That's the familial hypercholesterol community. And those are folks that have a genetic, very different way of metabolizing LDL. Won't go down that bunny hole, but we've covered it several times. When you say homozygous, again, just for those of us who may have gotten lost, that means you got one of these genes for FH from your mom and another gene for FH from your dad. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but you've got very serious difficulties, genetic difficulties in how you metabolize LDL. But as you bring up, even that, it's not as simple as it often seems. There seems to be a different population who metabolizes this stuff very, very differently. It's actually super relevant to me. And I'm very careful because I know this is hallowed ground. The assumption by Brown and Goldstein and really lipidology itself is that those same patients I was just talking about, like that little girl, it's assumed that the contribution to atherosclerosis, the buildup of plaque in her arteries, is entirely due to the higher concentration of LDL detected because she did have very high LDL. As you just mentioned, and let's take one form of familial hypercholesterolemia, which is the one they were studying, which has to do with the LDL receptor. You just saw my diagram on how there's uptake into tissues. That's receptor mediated, as in you can almost think of them as like fishing lines, right? There's mm. fishing lines with particular bait, if you will, to capture certain things. This isn't just with lipoproteins, but all sorts of things. Well, in the case of LDL receptors, if they're mutated and they have poor binding, that leaves more of the lipoproteins in circulation. But there is more than one thing going on here. It's not that it's just leaving those lipoproteins in circulation. It also means that nucleated cells that would have otherwise succeeded at getting the lipoprotein, they have the LDL receptor to bind to for whatever reason that cell wanted it, can't get it. And therefore, exactly what you just mentioned, there's an impairment in the metabolizing of that lipoprotein. And you want to know where this gets really interesting is in immune cells like macrophages. So they've done cultured studies where they culture the macrophages of those who have homozygous FH against controls who have normal macrophages, and they are different. The FH macrophages have different LDL receptor expression, seemingly to compensate for the lack of LDL receptor binding. They upregulate others that are part of the super family called LRPs. You may be familiar. For those of you who are in the audience who are more interested in digging a little bit deeper into that, I've got a series of videos on a thing called PCSK9. Yes. And that deals with a lot of the biology that Dave and I are talking about right now. There's actually yeah, an interesting class of drugs. Many of you have heard of them, the PCSK9 inhibitors. That series of drugs, that class of drugs was developed differently than the vast majority of drugs that we have available. You know, the vast majority of drugs, big pharma goes out to places like the Amazon or different islands and finds unusual chemicals. And then they come home, they put it in their bank and they, they test them against lab animals. And if they find something that's interesting to them, then they test further and sooner or later, they may get it into human use. That's not the way PCSK9 inhibitors were developed. They were developed based on the genetics that Dave is talking about right now. That arm that reaches up out of the cell, especially in the liver cells, and grasps an LDL particle and brings it down for metabolism within the liver cell. But what I would do is I would say, don't get distracted by spotlighting on the liver, which is where I think a lot of this problem comes up. Everyone's thinking, cool. they're so focused on the liver and how well or not well the liver is taking things in and out of circulation, they're not considering that other cells throughout the body may have reason to be taking up lipoproteins, which is why they've got the receptors in the first place. And that includes immune cells, that includes the cells that are actually working not only on fighting disease in your body, but also on repair. So naturally, as a scientist, I would think, hey, wait a sec, if we know there are a lot of lean mass hyperresponders with LDL levels comparable to those who have homozygous FH, but the homozygous FH population does tend to exhibit xanthomas, mm -hmm. like eruptive xanthomas and tendon xanthomas early on. And thus far, we're not seeing that predominantly hyper responders don't. In the lean mass hyper responder group. That's at a minimum, we're already saying there's at least a difference of context. Now, again, 
I want to be a good scientist. It could be that there's going to be some that develop them later. It could be that there's selection bias. Maybe some people do develop it, but they never tell anybody about it. All of that's possible, which is why we need perspective data. But that said, that's why the anecdotal data has led us to this point of going, I really think that there's just more to the story than high LDL, high plaque development. I think that there's a lot more, and especially where it comes back around to metabolism. To your point about liver, you know, we're not really worried about the liver in this whole scenario. We're worried about the arteries and plaque. This is a whole body issue. This is not just a liver issue at all. Absolutely. So yes, effectively the phenotype, I think for what it's worth, the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype, I believe is going to teach us a lot about metabolism. Put me down on the record right now for saying once we can start getting that phenotype more widely studied, and I think it will be. It just has to first be confirmed as to whether or not it's safe. Again, with all of the acknowledgement that we may find that my cautious optimism is wrong, it may be that we get to the end of the study and we do find that there is a rapid development of atherosclerosis. But assuming that we don't see that, then there will be a lot of important questions that I think should be getting addressed right now, which is exactly the things posited in the model. How much does our access and capability of managing and working with our fat cells have to do with the success or failure of the whole process of the immune response, especially as it applies to development of atherosclerosis. I think this could be a step in the right direction. Quick explanation. You and I keep geeking out. You use the term phenotype. For those of oh, yeah. us who don't remember that through us, there's phenotype and genotype. Genotype is the exact genes that you have. Phenotype is basically how those genes create a body and what the body actually looks like. So I think in this case, Dave's talking about a person who's lean, who's got that high HDL, that high LDL and the low triglycerides that you talked about. Yeah, it's, it's true. It kind of has a couple of colloquial uses. I'm using it more with regard to observed uh, characteristics per se, almost as lean body mass. Yeah. Well, and to be fair, that also kind of created some confusion. If I could go back in time, if I knew this would be such a consequential name, I probably would have called it something different because basically the lean mass part is observational. The cup points are the only thing that truly qualify it. So it became almost kind of a game of sorts where initially if somebody sent me a profile that had those cup points, I'd be like, you're probably lean lean, very low carb, and you're probably fit. And they would say, yes, how would you know that? Almost like it's a parlor trick. But at the same time, again, as an engineer, I can't help but think, wow, how amazing is it that without ever meeting or even knowing what somebody looks like, this particular lipid profile could so distinctively distinguish who they are and you know what their existing status is. Like I said, I think there's a lot to learn from it. And let me give you one more example. There are some folks who do start from a very metabolically challenged state, manage to lose a lot of weight, actually get really fit, and don't exhibit this phenotype for a while who eventually snap into it. There's a lot of folks I know who look just like that. And not that I'm encouraging them to think of it this way, but they themselves tend to think of it as kind of a barometer of sorts of whether they think they're getting towards more metabolic health. I don't know on that and I, I don't want to comment on it, but it is an interesting you know, thing that we may learn more about as we get more and more data that comes forward on it. We'll see. That is interesting. I see a similar thing happen with Dawn Effect and especially with post-exercise hyperglycemia. But I don't know if you get there, if you've got any focus in that area. I but have a strong opinion on that. I think that the higher your fatty acid affinity, because of how low carb you are, the more you're going, your body understandably would spare up your glucose availability. So the problem is people, when they get their glucose, they kind of start with the assumption that's indicative of production or insulin resistance. And I definitely push back on that because you don't really know how much is coming, you know, in on the on-ramp and how much is going off as it were, right? You don't know, mm -hmm. getting back to the, the boats in the harbor, you may want some boats that you intentionally want to keep in the harbor for those things that need it. So erythrocytes uh, like red blood cells, for example, you need glucose for those. Therefore, I'm not surprised, especially when somebody is very lean and metabolically healthy, like lean mass hyperresponders, they're more likely to have, say, fasting glucose and say, the 90s. Some are even in the low 100s. But you put a CGM on them, and what do you see? You see a flat board, right? But, you don't. Your yeah. glucose hardly moves. Right. To me, with the caveat that's a hypothesis, but I, I, would, I feel very strongly about it. I feel like that that is indicative of homeostasis. I feel like the body is successfully maintaining a delta, and it's doing it very well. And that if we were to really look in 
we wouldn't find any of the characteristics you typically find that traditionally mean it's type 2 diabetes, such as dysregulation. The higher fasting glucose is not indicative of, say, a hyperinsulinemic state or the peaks and valleys that we would typically see with somebody who's type 2 diabetic. In other words, I would bet a lot of money. Those folks are nowhere close to what we would consider that disease state. I think you're right. I have the same perspective. And I spend a lot of my time with patients who, once they get to a certain level of success, like we talked about earlier, their LDL will shoot up and they panic or their doctor panic. Or same thing, when they reach a certain level of success in terms of their glucose management, their fasting glucose starts to go up and or their post-exercise glucose, especially when they've been fasting and then gone into a, an exercise fasted. Well, Again, it's, I spend time telling them back off, don't jump off a cliff, don't stop doing what you're doing. Yeah, that I think is super normal. I think that glycogen stores in the liver being released when you exercise, especially if it's intense exercise, makes total sense. Again, if you have higher affinity for fat and it's getting spared out more for explosive effort on uh, you know, fast twitch muscles, again, I think that, that just falls in line. It all sort of makes sense. I hate to keep bringing it back to insulin, but the low fasting insulin is part of exactly what I'm looking at, especially when everything else seems to be so homeostatic. When you see pattern after pattern seemingly matching, but the insulin is is down at a fairly low level and it's not indicative of type 1 diabetes, which is literally insulin insufficiency, in which case we would expect glucose to be going like crazy up and down and so forth. I can't help but feel like that's, you know, something as intended by the body. But again, we'll need data to better understand and better find out. I'll, I'll say this, though. This is another reason why the LMHR study is so important, because we'll finally get to match it against actual hard endpoints. And the hardest endpoint that everyone's interested in is, of course, atherosclerosis. Absolutely. That's what we're looking for.